if you are into startups, if you are into entrepreneurship, then you gotta watch this video because right now we are live from the Elevate Demo Day number three. My name is Juan and I'm gonna be the host of the live stream from where we're gonna bring you very exciting pitches. We have a very exciting talk about machine learning brought to you by Rako, Jacob Raita. He's the AI head of, star, head, head of AI at the Venture. Now, you can see that I have a timer countdown going on here. When that hits zero, we will go directly to the stage as the event starts. Now, if you cannot see by any chance the live button that should be somewhere around in the screen, then that means that you're watching the recorded version of the live stream and you should go ahead and fast forward to the parts that you are interested. Super excited. In the meantime, I ask you to share, comment below because we are going to go through those comments later through the interviews that we have. We're going to be moderating them. So if you are interested on in applying for batch number four of the Elevate Accelerator program, then go ahead and ask us there because we'll be answering. I encourage you to share the live stream and also like it because we're going to be tracking those engagements as well from here in the studio. Soon we'll go to the stage where Reka will open the event and she will get this whole thing, whole party started. And after that, we'll come back here to the studio for some behind the scenes with members of our jury team. They are investors from Speed Invest and i5 Growth. We also will have Kathy Binder here. She is the program manager for the Elevate Accelerator program. And we're going to be discussing a bit more of how we got here today and actually how you can join us for a batch number four and then finally as well we'll have an interview with one of the mentors that is supporting the startups in this batch three so you can get a better feeling a better overview of how it is to be part of this batch number four so that's it from my side my name is Juan Guerra as I said and I'm gonna be hosting the live stream I'll be joining you here later once we finish with the startup. So for now, I'm going to leave you with some of the information, very important information for today's event. And as soon as the countdown hits zero, then we go to the stage. See you soon.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear startup enthusiasts, please don't be shy, come on in. We are happy that you're here with us today for the third batch of the Elevate Demo Day. Just as a very short show of hands, who has been here at the first or the second Demo Day? Good, good, good. So a lot of newcomers, super exciting. Great to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. I hope all of you know why we're here today. We're going to hear amazing startup pitching and telling you their great ideas and how they're going to foster and bring forward humankind, hopefully. And next to that, we also prepared things like, for example, a short lightning talk around AI and everything around it. So let's see if you can maybe also take something with you. Um, but before we get started and get into it, just very shortly, who am I and why am I talking? I have the honor to, for the third time in a row, guide you through the demo day. My name is Reka Atna, and I'm the program director at Pioneers. Now, a very short question also to you of who you are. So that's why we're going to take just a short millisecond to turn to your neighbor, because there's nothing more awkward than sitting next to somebody and trying to not touch that person without actually knowing who that person is. So please turn to your neighbor for a minute, just very shortly, and tell them who you are. Okay, so this doesn't really work with you guys. Let's try it again. Shh. Amazing. So just for future reference, if you're ever at any event where the moderator tries to catch your attention again and goes like this, it's kind of your sign to shh it a bit, okay? So for the next time, let's try to quiet down and focus our attention back. Super excited that you guys are so into sharing and getting to know the people around you. After our pitching up front here, we'll have a little networking over there and even an amazing after party. So I promise you there's going to be a lot of time to actually mingle network and get to know the fellow startup enthusiasts which are in the room, okay? Great. Now, obviously, an amazing demo day like this is not possible without great partners. And we're going to hear a bit more of also why they're supporting the venture and why they're supporting Elevate. But before we dive into that, also just a short shout out, maybe even a big round of applause to our amazing partners. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you for this excitement. Um, as you can see, we're sitting here in the rooms of the Accelerate. So also very thankful for um, having the Accelerate as one of our partners and also for them to actually give the room and host a lot of startup um, boot camps and all other workshops and events that they're doing together with the Venture and Elevate. So thank you so much. As you can see, if you turn a little bit, like if you turn around for a second and wave, you will say hi to our live stream. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. So as you can see, the room only holds a limited amount and we are already full. So we have a lot of people watching us online and following us online. So, hello to the live stream. Great to have you guys with us. There's also a function to put in your comments, ask your questions, and we'll try to include it as well. We also have some exclusive content for the live stream afterwards. There's a little booth set up over there, so we'll have some great interviews happening towards the end. So stay with us. There's some exciting content happening. And for all the other super tech savvy, digital natives amongst you. Um, we also prepared a hashtag, which is the Elevate Demo Day. You guessed it. So if you want to Twitter, uh, use Twitter and tweet away, Facebook, 
Instagram. I don't know, do people still Snapchat? Yes, okay, no, okay, people are silent. It's only for certain pictures, fair enough. Um, but you can use that hashtag whenever you want and just also share with the others who are not in the room with us what's happening. Great, now I keep talking a lot. <laughs> Obviously there are people who are a lot more qualified to tell you everything about the Venturi and tell you about Elevate, which is the accelerator for AI and machine learning. That's why we're here today. And for that, I would actually like to call on stage the CEO of the Venturi, Christoph Pitzner. Hey, this, yeah, it's working. Uh, warm welcome also from my side. Uh, I can't believe that this is already the end of batch three and that we are here at the third demo day of Elevate. Because when we started coming up with the concept of Elevate two and a half years ago, we were just four founders and three employees. So there were seven people in the end that started working on this concept. concept and very little did we know that by the end of a year after that, we would have helped four founding teams through the first batch with validating the problem and solution, with take, helping them taking their very hard decisions from pivoting, changing their concepts, adapting, continuing with their progress, or even close down, which is also a success if, you, if it helps avoiding resources. And of course, we help those that continued with building their product, with executing, and with going to market with their first product versions. Within that year, the Venturi itself had doubled in size and definitely more than doubled in experience, in knowledge, and in the learnings that we also as a company had. And this growth continued for us uh, up to now, where we more than doubled again, and we now have a team of brilliant minds, 32 people, that each and every one I can say is a great contributor and is truly passionate about technology and innovation. They really all, all want to help create an impact and help create and make our purpose a reality progress through entrepreneurship. They make it possible for DaVentry to provide lean and hands-on services in innovation management, cutting edge data and software engineering, and modern growth marketing. They provide this as accelerations for execution to startups and corporates alike along the whole journey from idea generation to global impact. These two target audiences that we are working with, they're inherently different, but they both provide value to each other and to the venture. Because the startups, they keep us agile, they keep us moving, and they keep us at the forefront of technology innovation, while the corporates add their stability. They have a different set uh, of tools that are, are coming with us, but some of the challenges are the same. So we help them also through this innovation funnel and, uh, and reach the final step, a product that fits the market. I'm very happy to see so many people here today that are also passionate about entrepreneurship and making ideas a reality. I'm very happy to welcome also many people from corporates that I just talked about that within their corporates try to push innovation as well. I'm also really glad that a few investors showed up because these investors, uh, they came here to see the startups today pitch and help them in the next step to grow. So last but not least, it, it is my turn to say thank you to the whole team that made it possible for Elevate to reach the third demo day. Uh, and thank everyone that came here. Thank everyone from the community that showed up because we believe that only through the whole community to cooperation and empowerment, we can grow innovation and make progress through entrepreneurship a reality. You and everyone that is here actually helped me that I can believe that it's already the third day, the third demo day of Elevate. Thank you. I will take that microphone. Good job, good job. I will take the microphone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Christoph. 
I think it was lovely to see how excited he was about the venture, and that's how it should be. A CEO should be excited about his own team, about his own company. So it's great to see that. But obviously, you know, a lot of times the CEO is the one to shine, and there are people who also put a lot of work into it, and they're usually a bit more in the background, but not today. We want to also put them on stage and give them a few minutes to tell you why they actually do what they do, and how is it possible that we're already celebrating the end of the third batch at Elevate. So for that, I would like to call on stage Katarina Binda and Valentin Ashaman. So hi, everyone, and also a warm welcome from my side. We are thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled to have such a broad range of um, different guests joining us at the demo day. Joining us to maybe learn something, joining us to get inspired, but of course also joining us to not miss great investment opportunities. And you will be the first ones hearing our startups pitch. They will pitch, they're really pitching here for the first time now. Um, during the fast, uh, past five months, we've worked with them um, and brought them from an idea to a product solution fit, a product market fit. And uh, we really did it, to, did it together with them. So um, because at the venture we realized that the biggest and the most important uh, empowerment for them is our help, is the talent of our amazing team. That's why each and every startup from our side gets one developer and one um, growth marketer into the team of the startup. So we're really getting our hands dirty and help them to execute things. Over the past five months, we, 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 we delivered 500 hours of IT development for them, 500 hours of growth marketing, and 500 hours of individual mentoring. That's not scalable, but it's defi definitely worth it. And such a resource-intensive program would have never been possible without great partners. And I want to express my special thanks to um, the Vienna Business Agency and the AWS. They have helped us to uh, create an acceleration program that, um, that, that, that really uses the opportunities that we have with artificial intelligence and tries to be the antithesis of, um, of having fear of technolog technological change. And the ambassadors for, for this change are the five amazing startups that we will hear pitching today. Last but not least, sorry, last but not least, I want to um, thank Katy Binder, the program manager of Elevate, um, who, made an, who did an amazing work here. Um, her passion and enthusiasm, is they're, they're really contagious. And um, she is the glue that puts all the puzzle pieces here together. So a big round of applause for Katy. It's my turn. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So, as Valentin just said, my name is Kathy. I'm the program manager. I spent a lot of time in the past five months with the teams. Uh, we had a wild ride, uh, ups and downs, pitch trainings that really didn't go so well, uh, pitch trainings that went a lot better a day after, uh, and we're really proud of what they have achieved and uh, the state they're in. Um, today, but obviously this all wouldn't have been possible without the people who are involved in in the program. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank our team, eight amazing people, growth hackers and IT developers, who spent so much time with the startups and really also put their ideas into into the startups, and they can share the success today with the startups. So big uh, round of applause for them. And of course, I don't want to forget our mentors and experts who um, really who came here to be with the startups, to share their experiences, their learnings. Um, Mona and Anno are here today in our jury as well. Um, thank you guys so much. You, you know, sharing experiences also means helping the startups not make the same mistakes that the mentors did maybe a while ago. Um, and my favorite part, uh, Rika just said, you know, we're going to tell you why we're doing what we're doing. My favorite part is seeing how brilliant minds come together and how the startups are working with this 
amazing community um, and how things are created. And this is why I also want to ask you in the audience today, when you're hearing the pitches later, ask yourself how can you support the startups, maybe by introducing them to somebody in your network uh, and talk to them after and uh, support them as well. Thanks for being here and have fun. Thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Valentin. Um, another great batch of excited people. It's great to hear your enthusiasm, and I think that will also reflect on the startup pitches later on. I think that we'll just have as exciting pitches as the two up here just did. But before we really dive into the serious pitching, the very serious timekeeping and all that, and the very serious panel of jury members awaiting the pitchers, we'll have a little short, maybe not that short, but super informative and interesting, lightning talk. Um, we'll have on stage a founding partner of the Venturi, a real expert on AI, and he's gonna give a talk and it's called The Hitchhiker's Guide to AI. So I really hope that we're gonna get a bit more information than just 42 by the end of it. Um, and before we get into it, I would love to hear just with like shout outs. So really just shout it at me. When you hear AI, what do you think of? Just give it to me, just shout. AI, what does it mean to you? You can just, buzzword, what else? Future. Chatbots, machines are taking over. Any other impressions? <laughs> Jacob, very good. I think that's a smooth transition uh, to our next keynote speaker. Please welcome Sage Jakob Reiter. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I was asked as a short introduction because AI is this big buzzword that we hear about all day to give everyone who is not so familiar with the technology a little bit of an overview and a little bit of insight what it is. To all those super tech savvy people, I apologize. This is going to be more an introduction -y course. But uh, come see me later and so we can nerd around in the, in the corner about the real deep technology. So I'm looking forward to that. So, um, as the introduction says, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Artificial Intelligence. I choose that name because I wanted to make it very lightweight in the way that we go. So, uh, come, come with me on a ride. And as classical as the movie was, first things first, who am I? So, as the introduction says, I, I'm one of the founding partners at The Venturi. I am the current uh, circle lead for backend and data engineering. And I'm also appointed member to the ESO Joint Technical Committee Subcommittee 42 on the standardization of artificial intelligence. Yes, standardization is fun. Um, and uh, so I've been thinking a lot about artificial intelligence, what is involved, and I'm happy to share a little bit about that. But first, always bring a towel. Start with a definition, right? What is artificial intelligence? And that's already the point where it gets juicy, because we don't know. This term is so widely used, it's so ubiquitously nowadays in a startup scene that it's really hard to pin it down what it actually means. And if you look into the, uh, standardization documents, you don't find a coherent standard definition. So here are my three tries to find something that comes at least close to a definition. So first, it's always good to look at the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. And there it says, the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. That's vague. Uh, but it also, it already includes two things that I think are really remarkable. It includes performing a task, so we're doing something, and we're doing something in a way that we normally associate with human beings, right? So with intelligent beings or human beings, the definition varies sometimes. So that I think is great, but there is one definition I like a little better, which is, Artificial intelligence is that activity devoted to making machines intelligent, okay. And intelligent is that quality that enables an entity to function appropriately and with foresight in its environment. That already gives you a little bit of a hint where it goes. It is interesting because the definition goes in a quality sense, so it is that quality that makes a system 
better or it's just a quality that makes it smarter and that this entity has some functional appropriability in its environment. So we have some environment that the system integrates in and some functional probability. What's interesting with this, if you think uh, that uh, it's maybe a little too high of a definition, given that it might be arguable if humans actually pass that with functional appropriately in its environment. Um, there's one definition I also really like, and that touches very much what we heard with the buzzword, is the definition to say, artificial intelligent is everything sapient and smart that we do not know how to build. Because the moment we know how to build it, we give it another name. So per definition, AI is the buzzword of everything we don't know yet. Because the moment we know how to build it, we start to give it a name of linear regression, deep learning algorithm, deep neural net. We give it another name that specifies it more, and the rest stays artificial intelligent. Right? So that's why I like that definition also, because the buzzword is inherent in that definition. Good. So where does AI generally fit in? And I was asked to like define industries that AI might touch. And I, I was like, yeah, I cannot name all industries, right? Because in the end, AI is a tool in your toolbox that you can use to solve a specific problem. And with all tools, you have to be very careful to not fall into the instrument bias. That you say, if I have a hammer, every problem is a nail, right? And if you ha only have artificial intelligence, you have to knock everything with artificial intelligence. That might not be necessary, but it might be the right solution. So consider AI as something you have in your toolbox to use for a specific situation where artificial intelligence can and is useful. So there are basically two uh, basic approaches of artificial intelligence. This is quite arguable, but I think it's, it can boil to two uh, appro approaches. The first approach is a very rule-based approach that we find during the 1950s, 1960s, uh, where we worked a lot with knowledge graphs, semantic web, symbolic AI. This is what's the good old school artificial intelligence that we know. Still valid, still works, still has its merits. And then there's this new shiny fancy thing that we do with machine learning, where we basically have three categories that we distinguish. The first one is supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And within supervised learning, we have this big buzzword called deep learning that I'll explain to you in a minute. So, what is the big difference? What is the big difference? Yeah, obviously don't panic, I'll explain it to you. So what's the big difference between supervised and unsupervised learning? And that's actually super primitive. Supervised learning is learning categories from labeled data. So if you have a two-dimensional coordinate system and you have crosses and you have spheres, what you learn in the system is to differentiate with this boundary condition between the spheres and uh, the crosses. So if a new data point comes in here, the system would learn that it's a cross because the boundary condition tells us that everything above here is a cross and everything below here is a sphere. That's a very simple example for like a two-dimensional problem. In reality, the problems get way more complicated, but I think it's good to understand. So the system learns from those data that you give it to him, and you give him the solution and say, here's the solution from a couple of examples, now learn from it. On the other hand, unsupervised learning, I would say, is learning insights from raw data. You don't have the solution to the problem, but you give him all the circles and then say, please find the circles that are similar to each other. Uh, so it finds those clusters here, for example, and says like those four circles and those they're kind of similar. I don't know what they mean, but I know they have some similarity in those coordinate systems, right? So it learns that if, if a circle comes here, it might actually be in this cluster. It has no understanding if this is cats, dogs, and rabbits, but it knows there's some similarity to it. And that's what it learns. So deep learning and deep neural networks are now something that goes a little bit deeper into supervised learning. What you have here is really interesting from a perspective. You have a net with some input sensors and some output sensors. And then you have those yellow neurons in the middle. And then at the beginning, when you start training the neural net, all those connections are randomly instantiated with weight. Completely random. Doesn't, doesn't make any sense. It's just randomly associated. And then you start training it. And you start training it by applying 
the question and the answer and tell the network to find a solution where if you apply this, the right things comes out. So you're training the weights in the network backwards to really give you the same distribution that you would need to have the correct answer. And you do this with a lot of data. And then something very interesting happened. Those weights, they adjust themselves. So if you put something new on the red, you suddenly get a correct blue as an outcome. It's magic. And to show that a little bit, because then it becomes clear, I made a little video. So uh, for everyone that doesn't know, that is the uh, TensorFlow play, uh, Playground. What you have here is the, the red inputs, then you have uh, the yellow uh, uh, neurons, and then you have kind of the outcome here. And let's start the training of the neural network. So you see this is the trainings data here, and you start to see the loss curve, like how the training of the neural network works. You start to see that the network learns. It learns this corner quite well. It has a bit of mistakes here. But as you see, the neural network adapts quite, and yeah, there it learns it, right? So over time, the weights here adjusted correctly to have the right output in terms of the uh, coordinate system that is needed to learn that structure. Again, very easy, very abstracted, but that's basically what happens under the hood. So, last but not least, reinforcement learning, and that's, that's the real catch. Reinforcement learning is basically learning sequential decisions or decision making in a process or in a maze. So what it does is you have this little system here where an agent takes an action in an environment. The action is monitored by an interpreter. The interpreter says this was a good or bad action through a reward and then gives the state to the agent. So the agent can then takes the next action. And everything that the agent does is basically to optimize this reward maximize the reward in that function, right? So you have a really flowing system where the agent tries to maximize its rewards function. Obviously, you have to have a good reward function because if, you, if your reward function is not good, you're optimizing the wrong way. And that's kind of the trick you have to follow through. So let's pin that down a little bit on the landscape. Let's take a look back. Where, where are those techniques? And I think there's, there's a really nice crosshair to play on the artificial intelligence space. So on, on the one hand of the crosshair, you have a very narrow, specific trained AI. And on the other hand, you have a very general, universally applicable artificial intelligence. And on the y-axis, you have weak or pattern-based AI and strong human-like AI. So the easy parts are quite easy to spot. Hollywood is here, right? Hollywood is general, strong, human-like AI. This is all the movies that we see. This is the futuristic Terminator, whatever you want. And the classical symbiotic if-else decision tree is absolutely here in the corner. It's maybe even here in the corner, right? So this is basically the extremes. So where does the rest of the, um, of the methods fall into? Well, Supervised and unsupervised learning are still very weak. They're very pattern-based driven artificial intelligence, but they are not so narrow. They can be used in a lot of applications, in a lot of different use cases. Deep learning is a little bit more stronger, but it's still very narrow. It can only train what you give it to the network, and then based on that, execute that. And the interesting part is reinforcement learning, because it sits quite nicely there in the corner of quite interestingly on the reward function, quite strong, but also quite interesting on the narrow margin because it can be used for a lot of examples, as we'll tell you in a minute. So as you can see, we're still very much in the left corner of artificial intelligence. We haven't touched anything, machines taking over conscious beings, tomorrow the Terminator starts. There's still a long way to go that direction. So what can I do with artificial intelligence? There's so many use cases, and I tried to break it down into a couple of use cases that might be interesting to everyone in the audience. So you can do text processing, right? You can classify text, you can write a chatbot, you can communicate with a robot, you can do sentiment analysis, trying to get the mood out of the language, out of a sentence. Is that email written angry or is it not angry? And then based on that, take some actions. Uh, we have done this, for example, in a, in a lot of our chatbots, dialogue management systems. Uh, Whoever has followed the news, uh, a friend of mine 
was debating uh, an I, the IBM debater. It's a machine from IBM that focuses on debating human beings uh, and actually did incredibly well. It's actually worth watching that debate because the entire argument in that debate was done by a machine, um, which is super incredible. And then, for example, talking to a robot, um, having, having some sort of a dialogue management system that conveys messages or receives calls. That's everything possible with text processing. Then there is audio processing, also very interesting. A lot of our stuff still happens over telephone lines or in Skype calls. So here you have speech to text, speech synthesis. We see a lot of stuff where um, actors are actually re reincarnated by giving them a voice back and like giving them new sentences even though they have died years ago. And there also machine learning is essential because it's quite hard to map those faces in the audio stream to like individual characters. And with the fuzziness of artificial intelligence, this actually helps a lot. And we're seeing this more and more today in like those small devices that are more and more spreading in our homes and have like incredible uh, rise of prediction models. Uh, for example, the, those three devices alone had last year a growth of 126% in the market. So people are really interested in adapting this technology into their homes. And then there's speech to text, text to speech, different ways of communicating with robots. Image processing, this is also very interesting. A lot of research has been done on that field. Um, so there is classification. There is a cat in the picture. Then there's classification plus localization. Here is the cat in that picture. Then there's object detection. I have a cat, a dog, and a duck. And then the interesting part is uh, uh, instance segmentation. This is exactly the outline of the dog, of the duck, and the cats. Because if you can do that, then you can do that. Then you can look at the street and say, oh, this is a car and it has a vector, so it moves that direction. Maybe my automated car should drive differently. Oh, there is a bicycle with a person on it. Maybe I should not crash into it. So um, this image processing and the segmentation really helps in making autonomous cars possible. Again, all driven on machine learning and image segmentation. And then there's a field that I called automation, which is all about in, in, in today's days, is bringing a process better and better into the forefront. And here you have a potpourri of really interesting stuff from workflow automation to chat ops, if you automate stuff in your, in your environment. Predictive maintenance is a really hot topic, trying to get to machines before they have a maintenance problem. Uh, anomaly detection, fraud detection, quality assurance, through all the process of stages and recommender engine that we have seen already quite uh, a lot of it. So as a final step, I want to give you something really from the bleeding edge and I've been really happy that Google uh, published it a couple of days ago and that's basically this. This doesn't look like bleeding edge but it is absolutely bleeding edge. So who of you guys know StarCraft? Okay, there's some gamers, who? Nice. So StarCraft, StarCraft 2 is a, is a game that is basically played all over the world. It's one of the massive multiplayer, really the thing played in the community. And what uh, Blizzard did a couple of years back was open source the controls so that an artificial intelligence could start playing the game. So what you see here is uh, a game recorded by Alpha Star, which is an artificial intelligence playing a game. What's really interesting, and you might have heard of this game called Go. Go is kindergarten compared to that. The complexity of playing StarCraft II is about 100,000 times more complex than playing Go. So they trained an AI to play an, an instant game, and what you see here is basically what I explained before, reinforcement learning. You have an observer that observes something, then you have the agent, it's three neural nets that will move in a second then it will identify what to build. And what's really interesting, it gives you a predicted outcome whether or not it will win or lose the match. So everything that you see here is a complete player emulated by an artificial intelligence playing an online live game against a programmer. And it actually won the game against the programmer. Not just one game, but 10 to one. And what's really interesting is that in the interview, the, the programmer after it, and they said, 
The computer did moves he didn't have ever seen from another human being. So the machine invented moves in that game that were unknown to humans before. And that's not just a game played by a couple of people, but by thousands of people all the world. And that's really impressive. I encourage everyone to watch that game, even though you don't understand StarCraft. It's really impressive, uh, impressive to see and learn. So I want to finish this lightning talk with three big myths that we see in our daily work and that I think are really good uh, takeaways for everyone here in this room. So the first big myth that we always encounter is you can't buy AI. There's a lot of people coming and saying, can, where can I buy AI? And I normally respond to, you can't buy AI. You can buy the AI system, and you can then train it for whatever data you have and for whatever use case you have. But buying the whole thing is just not possible. You need to invest training. That's very unusual for us because we use that a program comes out of a box and works perfectly, and now we have to train the system. So that's a rethinking in how computer systems work. The second big myth is AI can't learn on its own, small asterisks. If it has a reward function, that's very specific. But generally speaking, if you repeat something 20 times to a chatbot, it doesn't make him learn, because it needs the trainings data, it needs the curation to bring it back into the normal learning cycle that needs to be started. And the third big myth is AI is like human intelligence. Human intelligence is so complex and we haven't understood it fully yet our own, so we cannot design a system that is similar to ourselves. So the best we can do for now is mimic certain parts of our own brain and our own intelligence and create very weak and very narrow pattern artificial intelligence specific to a use case and only that use case. So take away leaving thoughts. AI might be limited as of today, but it's already very powerful. We see a lot of things happening with a very primitive technology in artificial intelligence, and it's, we're just starting. This is not just something that is full potential already, but this is something that we're getting more and more of. AI is custom built and trained, so there's a lot of advantage in niche products being currently developed because Google can't build everything, but if you have a niche and you can really get the data and really nail the process, you can build something incredible with a very small team. And, and that's probably the most, there has been some hype about artificial intelligence in the last history and in the last decades. Now we have reached a quality that makes it productible that we can use it in production and we can put products out there that have the quality we need to run it efficiently in an environment. That's the first time we have that in that quality. So therefore, I'm super excited to hear now the startup pitches and uh, leaving you with the classic quote from the movie again, so long and thanks for all the fish. So you got a little bit of gin. Oh, gin fan. You're a huge gin fan. So you cannot buy AI, but you can buy gin. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, thank you so much for your uh, uh, lightning talk. I hope we know a lot more now about AI. Because when I asked before, I mean, to be honest, I got like five replies. So I hope that all of us now know a bit more. Uh, and also know when the startups up here are pitching, then what, what are they actually talking about? Great. Um, before we jump into just very shortly the flow for you guys. So how's it going to happen? We're always going to watch a short video to give you a bit of an insight of the journey that the startups had in the Elevate Accelerator. And then we are going into the five minute pitch. We're quite strict on the five minutes, so really cut them off afterwards. And then we have the roasting jury with us today, who will then have another five minutes to then really go into the Q&A and ask maybe unanswered questions. Great. And this, I think, is a super leeway, yes, to also introduce them and give them the power to talk and their microphones. Um, it's great to have you guys with us. Just a short introduction. So we have Arno Baker from Speed Invest. I spiced it up a little bit, didn't I? <laughs> then we have Simona Huber from i5 Growth. And we have Sasha Radic from Conda. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much for being with us here today. You two are already a, a bit biased because as I know, you have already been coaching and mentoring the lovely startups that are going to pitch. But still, I hope you have some questions prepared for them. Great. And Sasha, you just enjoyed the show. Awesome. Perfect. Great. So let's jump into the very first pitch. Also, short reminder, for the ones who put up their hands before that they've already been with us during a demo day, this person is going to come up, might be somebody you already know, or already have seen, because as the first pitch, we have prepared somebody from the second ba batch, so they've already been with us, they've already pitched here before but we want to reminisce a little bit and also see startups of how developing after leaving Elevate. So please come on stage with me and a big round of applause for Laurence Wagner. I know you wanted to jump right into it and you wanted to pitch right away, maybe just shortly. You're coming from the startup AI on Fire, and today we're going to hear the product. It's called Janus, is that correct? And we have seen that pitch before, but before we jump into it, um, as mentioned before, maybe you can give us a little bit of an insight of what happened since you left Elevate. What are some exciting things? Are you missing the family? <laughs> Well, um, I think it's um, when, when you start up with your startup, uh, it's a long journey. And um, there are thousands of things, thousands of things to do. And I think it's, it's a long journey and you have some milestones, like the Elevate Demo Day was a great milestone for us. And uh, the most important thing is to elevate. And oh. I think that's something we do in <laughs> Perfect. I see what you did there. So the most important thing is to elevate. I hope that's also something that the other startups take with them. As you guys heard, um, the demo day was a starting point for you guys as well. I'll give that last great push. Milestone. And great milestone. Amazing. So we have a lot of us here with us. That's also going to be a milestone for them. Um, so I think we jump right into it and we're going to let you pitch. You have five minutes. I'm going to cut you off afterwards. Um, uh, here are your slides. And we're super excited. A Thank big so round of applause. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce Janos. Janos um, is our software, and it's an AI-based, downloadable, artificial as intelligence IT administrator. So you maybe know that guy, the IT administrator, and we make it downloadable. Um, but I came up to that a few slides later. First, I'd like to introduce our great team. We are four co-founders uh, with a strong technical background. That's important if you deal with AI. And um, for example, for me, I was responsible for about 10 years for a private data center. And within my job, I get confronted with um, IT operation issues and all the problems around it. And it's a really hard job. And on the other side, the financial part. The, um, if you operate a data center, the operation is really expensive. And that's the reason why we came up to the idea to make a download downloadable IT administrator using AI technology. <clears throat> so downloadable is very important. And um, in other words, to get more specific to our product, um, we invented Janos as a cross device. So Janos isn't addicted to uh, IT devices only, also vehicles, um, industry machines, or even other IT, IoT devices around us. And uh, Janos is cross vendor, so we are not addicted to a certain uh, manufacturer of IT devices or a certain cloud service provider, we are cross-vendor. And uniquely, and that's very important, uh, we have a conversational in conversational interface. Um, so we build something, a machine you can talk to, and the machine is talking to you. And communication is super important in that case. In, there is a term, um, Gartner, you may know that 
know that company, bring it up in 2017, and it's called AI Ops. Before, you talked about um, SysOps, that was the common name, and now everybody's talking about AI Ops. What is AI Ops? It's the applied AI technology within system over or IT operation. And there is a huge market growth because also AI is very important for the IT industry. Um, let's go, get more specific on the, on the market or on the producers or vendors of, of AI tools. Of course, everybody likes to use AI within their products. So there are 24, 25 major AI op tools. And there's another term that's called AI op platform. And it's a little bit different because um, it's not a specific tool for a specific purpose like the 24. So they like to bring everything together using AI. And that's where Janus is placed. But Janus is different from this, um, one of the most different from the five companies there. Uh, we have five key differentiators. One is the interactive conversational interface. What we think is super important to talk to machines. We are cross-device. That's also very important in our opinion. And also the cross-vendor thing. Because the bigger companies, you may know HP, they have their own products and they are addicted to their own products and want to stay um, specific vendor. And we have two other additional things. It's self-deployment. So if we talk about a machine that is uh, intelligent, it has to deploy itself in an infrastructure. And we have something that is uh, demanded very often in IT operation. It's 4i principle. If you look to the market, it's a very huge market. We identified about 8,000 ideal customers in, within Europe. And uh, the average spendings on IT is about 4% of the yearly revenue of that company. And even if they are not IT companies, they spend a lot of money on that. So everybody's faced with that. And if we take one of our target customers with an 1 billion yearly Euro yearly revenue, uh, 4% about uh, 40 million euros, and about 50% of that amount is spent on IT operations only. Uh, with Janus, we do some kind of automation using the AI, and so we can help the companies to save about 20 to 50% uh, of their spendings, and there's a uh, 4 to 10 million euros a year, and that's a really huge number and a really huge potential. How do we do that? We had a great introduction on AI. AI. Uh, we also use that. We use uh, different kinds of uh, AI models to face the problem. Uh, the customers demanded these three major domains uh, to be perfect in IT operation. And we use NLP, deep learning, um, very specific AI algorit algorithms, and heuristic logic to build a more intelligent, uh, artificial intelligence because we'd like to go to Hollywood. Um, currently, we are raising 250K euros. So yeah, if you're interested in revolutionize IT operations, then please come up to us and talk to us. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much for your pitch, Lawrence. Maybe we go a bit closer to the jury. Um, great. Are you not blinded? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah perfect. Great. So, guys Can and you girls, it's up to you. Yeah. Who goes first? Cool. Um, like, I'm the one who hasn't seen the pitch so far, so <clears throat> I would ask you actually one, one particular question. Um, I'm still having a hard time to really understand what what the actual problem is that you're, you're you are about to solve. So could you provide me and the audience maybe one particular like use case, um, one particular problem as an example that 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 that, that your company would would solve? For sure. Um, there are a couple of problems. Uh, one problem is uh, using modern technology like um, hybrid cloud solutions, 
um, AI technology. And when using more technology, you get a big, bigger technology stack, and it's hard to keep the overview of all your infrastructure, of all your assets. That's a really good, great pain. And it's really hard, or it's getting more and more harder, to get the human resources doing your IPT operations. And that's also a use case where you can use Janus to do a couple of the tasks for you, and you have more free human resources. When you say IT operations, again, could you just give an example? Um, for example, Janus is monitoring your services autonomously, and if something gets broken, Janus tries to fix that for you, and you save the time to investigate the problem and to solve it. That's one, one specific use case for Janus. So it's, it's this human you normally know in your company who is responsible for the IT services, and we make it in the software. So it's not a tool. We try to simulate the human is doing the job normally. So it's, it's, it's really the, the basic idea of AI we put into Janus. Where are you at in terms of roadmap? Is the product fully developed? Do you have any traction yet? Did you validate product market fit? Yeah, we. We did really a lot of um, talks to enterprise customers because they are our target group. Um, we, at the moment, we are work, We have six POCs in our queue. We're talking to the customers, uh, specifying them in detail um, to ship them. And that's the phase we're currently, we want to finish these six POCs until the end of the year to get a product that is ready. So they have a lot of uh, input for us all the time, and we try to develop Janus in the way they need it. What is your business model, and what are the corresponding sales channels? The um, sales channel is quite easy, because um, at the moment it's direct market. Um, we, it's a very new product, so uh, you have to go there and talk to them, show them how the product is working, because it's really new, even for the bigger co enterprise corporates. Uh, business model is very easy. It's common in IT um, software. Uh, we have three modules, um, depending on the functionality, and it's paid, built per minute per month. And on top of it, there's an enterprise support fee because bigger enterprises like uh, to have somebody to talk to if something is not working the way they want. Um, did I miss something? What? If I would decide that I wanted to use your product, yeah. how does the setup look like? Can I do the setup myself? Do I always need one of you guys to help me with setting up everything? Yeah, we, we, we really try to have a scalable SaaS business model. So you can download Janos, um, put it in your network. Janos will guide you through the enroll of the product within your network infrastructure. And you need no additional support from us because you all get the support from Janos directly. And uh, Janus do the self-deployment on its own, so you can watch him doing the stuff. Um, yeah, just maybe one question. Like, so you're you're in the like platform space, right? So you're going head on head with guys like IBM, HP, yeah. even MOOCs of the race, like close to 100 million dollars, right? Yeah. Big corporate. So what stops any of them to to build on top of their solutions, like? like conversational interface or any of the other modules that you have? Yeah, in that case, it's, it's not easy to, to put on um, to an existing solution um, conversion is conversational interface, like you can talk to over Slack or something like that. Uh, you can do that, but it's different if um, Janus is based on communication. So if they want to do the same, they have to renew their application completely, so they have to reinvent that. For sure, it's possible for them maybe to do this in, in a certain couple of time. Um, but we don't, we, 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 it's not important to be the, fir, uh, the, the one and only to have a solution for that. But if we are the first one having that solution doing that, then I'm fine, I would say. And maybe, maybe they, they will buy it. I don't know. <laughs> Something. Hopefully. I right. put in concern. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. We're out of time. Thank you so much. A big round of applause to Laurens. Thank you. May I also take the clicker? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. As promised before, 
we will have uh, for now every startup that's going to come up from now onwards and was part of batch number three has a short video to show you their journey with Elevate. And first up, we have Tudor. They're demystifying and improving the process of getting into elite universities. So please enjoy the next video of Tudor. We recognize that students are very, very different, that they learn in different ways, that they have very different approaches to things, and also that their timetables are different. But, you know, they, they need resources that are on demand. Some people, <laughs> they need to learn on the bus home. Some people need to fit it around their homework. Some people can't start working until you know, 10 p.m. at night because that's how long it takes them to get home, look after their siblings, things like that. So we need to be able to fit around. The forefront is personalization. We want to make sure that people are only learning what they need to learn to perform their best, and we want them to be able to learn it in that way on that time. Big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! So you have some fans. Did you bring your little fan group with you? <laughs> great, so here with me on stage is David Coates, is that how you pronounce it? Perfect, great to have you with us. Now, as you saw before, um, to rise the tension, I'm always asking a mean question before you actually go into the pitch, is that fine? Um, so just maybe the audience doesn't know, I mean since, or maybe some do, the, your fan group, um, but the others might not know that you actually took the Oxford entry exam yourself, right? So you really know the target th group that you're going to be talking about very shortly. Now, was that something that kind of motivated you for your startup, or um, what's the background? Yeah, I, I would say that the main emotion that I felt uh, when I first took this test was fear, a lot of fear. I was terrified uh, at the prospect of taking a very, very important exam without having a lot of resources to rely on. I remember a lot of my friends walked into that exam and they were just gonna, you know, give it a go, take a punt. But and not you. No, a little bit me, honestly, a little bit me, but don't tell my students that. <laughs> um, yeah, I remember that everyone was just kind of trying it and they didn't feel that confident. And when you remember that this is one of the most important exams of their life, right, right, it doesn't right. really add up. Great. But how about your studying time? How do you remember that? I remember that a lot of it was spent uh, desperately trying to work out what to do before I could even do the things. Um, so hopefully, Tutor will provide students a way to actually get around that problem. <gasps> Perfectly vain to your pitch. Here is the clicker. Here are your slides. All the best. Big round of applause. Thank you. Good evening, Vienna. My name is David, and I am the CEO of Tutor. Tutor is a web app-based platform which is designed to help applicants prepare for admission tests. Now, admission tests are used by universities, schools, even quite a lot of jobs, and their main aim is to discriminate between students. As a result, admission tests are a nightmare. They're very hard, they're very, very fast-paced. And a lot of the time, students will see questions that they have never seen anywhere else before. I'm going to show you some of these questions now. OK, so just be prepared. Don't get freaked out. But imagine you're a student sitting down and seeing one of these. Huge numbers of graphs, of tables, of photos. These are things that students very rarely see in your average exam. And you only have about 30 seconds per question to read and understand it before you then have to solve it. I'll take it away now. Don't worry. But this isn't the only problem that a student faces. Tutoring for these admission tests is extremely expensive. A lot of students can't even afford this. When you can find a tutor, you can't guarantee their quality. A lot of tutors are students, and the quality tends to be low. Finally, the actual product that is produced by these tutors is not personalized. The tutors have a lot of students, and they're not available whenever the student actually needs them. Our solution to this is pretty simple. We're just taking a smarter approach to admissions testing. Students shouldn't have to choose between low prices, availability, and actually high quality content when they can have them all in one place. So how are we doing this? This is how Tutor actually helps students. Two steps to this process. The first is through an initial assessment. By using games, we can identify the weakest points of a student's profile and show them hinges 
which are magical ways by which they can very rapidly improve their performance overall. After this, we are actually able to engage students on a much higher level and keep them involved. The second process is the AI-driven platform to actually provide content to the students. By consistently revising and improving our product based on students' progress, we're able to offer them the most efficient way to improve. We're motivated by the fact that a lot of tutors are not of a high quality. We don't think that it, it makes sense to allow students to waste their time, and we're constantly thinking about where they're going. When it comes to students' futures, they shouldn't be left guessing. So let's meet the team. There are, four fee, there are four key contributions which this team provides. Five years of tutoring experience, three years of AI expertise, some data science magic, and finally, a very talented and experienced developer and designer. All of these allow us to build an efficient and engaging platform for students. We're starting small, targeting the UK market to begin with, looking at admission test takers for Oxford, Cambridge, and medical school exams. Expanding outwards, you can see 330,000 students in the UK alone every single year. But when you take a step back to the global stage, the numbers get even bigger. Valued at 18 billion euros last year and growing at a rate of 14% per year for four years, other competitors such as Kaplan have started to really take advantage of a market that allows us massive room for expansion. But how do we differentiate ourselves from these competitors? Tutor is focused on two metrics that students consistently tell us are the most important. The quality of resources, how good is this thing? Is it making me better? And the personalized plan. What can you do for me? How can you take me from where I am now to where I want to go? By starting small and focusing on quality of resources and personalization, we are able to produce a much higher quality of product. This is something we're gonna keep with us as we expand. Our business model is pretty simple. We sell individual packages for indivi to individual students to help them prepare for a test. We're so confident in the quality that we're offering a refund guarantee for early adopters so that we can encourage people that they're in safe hands. The milestones we've achieved so far are that we have done our market research. We've worked out what the students want and we've created our content. In the first quarter of 2019, we're onboarding alpha testers and then building through the exam schedules of medical students and Oxford and Cambridge students into the third quarter of 2019. In 2021, we want to expand to the full UK market. And in order to do this, we're currently raising 250,000 euros of capital. This is going towards building a platform which is applicable to all tests across the world, and also on building our brand image through online marketing. We're starting a revolution for admissions testing. If you want to find out where we've been and where we're going, I urge you to come up and talk to me. Thanks. The jury, please. So I assume that the core of your product is the content and the high quality resources. Uh, who produces the content and how does it get onto the platform and how do, you, how do you guarantee the quality? So the first amount of content is actually produced by myself. Uh, having been a tutor for five years, I know exactly what is helping students to improve. I've boosted uh, the rates of success for schools across the country now. We have already onboarded medical school uh, experts who are able to produce that content. And then after that, we're going out to uh, the best tutors to scale past that point. I know what it takes to improve a student's performance, and more importantly, we are measuring the content and its success through the artificial intelligence platform, so we can get constant feedback on what works and what doesn't. Yeah, I, like, I was going into the same direction. Um, as, you, as you told, the quality of resources is, is, is the USP, so to say, and you said you know what the quality is, but like, how? How measurable is this, and how can, for example, Kaplan not ensure that they do have high quality of resources too? On the one hand, and, and, the, and the second question would be, um, where's the AI in the whole thing? Yeah, great question. So I'll start with your first point, which is talking about the quality of resources. Now, because we're starting small, uh, we are able to simply outmatch Kaplan. Kaplan stretches themselves very thin, and all of the tutors in the market at the moment are of very variable quality. We're focusing very, very small, and we're using the system that we have already built, which we know helps students improve, and consistently using AI to actually improve that. So moving on to your second point, where the AI comes in, two ways. The first way is that we're actually help, uh, we're gathering students into groups, 
which is a very, very simple process, which is currently backed by the uh, University of Sunderland. And what this allows us to do is look at the ways that some students improve compared to others. The best part of this is that we know then when a student steps in and they do well at maths, but they don't do so well at English, that we can give them these kinds of lessons and we know that that's likely to see the biggest improvement. To begin with, the AI is gonna be small, but we hope that it's gonna give us a real advantage moving forward. And, and now again, to the quality of resources, because again, this is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, you said like, you know what the good quality of resources is. Now, the business model of tutors should be, it, it should be able to work without you because if something happens to you in a car accident or something, the investors shouldn't be the one who loses all, you know, like, <laughs> the investors shouldn't be the one who loses all the money because all, 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 like, actually, are you the USP then? If um, To begin with, the platform will run off the success that I've already had, but the uh, examination of the tests that I've been able to carry out over five years means that I can basically put it into an algorithm format there are seven key metrics that we can use to evaluate questions and evaluate student performance, and this is something that then is very much scalable without me. Um, so, like maybe also with the comment, right? So the the first first you're going after the UK market because you know the market, you know like Oxford, Cambridge, and all these guys. So, but so I'm trying to understand, like especially from a VC perspective, these kind of models need need to be. Be, you need to be able to replicate them, right? So I'm trying to understand how do you feel about how can you replicate this model in other countries and go, do you go school by school, like test by test? Mm -hmm. And then maybe more, more broadly, what's the geo strategy behind, behind that thought, right? So in terms of going school to school, in the UK that doesn't really work because students are spread very thinly. Luckily though, there is a lot of market pull. There are people out there searching for resources every day and forums are full of students looking for it. This gives us really easy choke points to kind of market to. When we expand to other countries, the plan is to go kind of school by school because in those countries, for example, Israel and the US, every single school has enormous numbers of students who are taking these tests every year. So we'll kind of change our strategy uh, depending on the country. But then that means like for every school and every test you need to create this let's say a medical school or a medical test, you need to create this medical content, right? And right now you're doing this mm -hmm. as an individual. So like, mm -hmm. how is it gonna look in the future? Like when, when all operations are functioning and how are you gonna like scale this? Yeah, so the content for these tests obviously has already been created. Uh, the content for future tests, we currently have general uh, assessments that we can use for any test, things like maths, English, comprehension, very easy to, to produce. But for the more specialist areas, then we're looking to outsource that then to tutors who are then going to get kind of a royalty or a commission on what is produced, but only the best tutors. And it allows us to really get the content from the best tutors out to the wider public. Okay, thanks. Um, do we have time for? One more question. So I, j I just want to understand, what's the big vision here for you? The big vision is that we are able to take Tutor to uh, countries such as the United States, Israel, in globally, and we are able to produce a platform that can massively improve people's performances. We want to kind of level the playing field across all of these exams and really give people the way to showcase their own skills. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Also, thank you for clicking through your backup slides. I very much appreciate that. So I can swiftly introduce our next pitching startup. Next up, we has, have Espresso Labs, and they're here with their product, Hello Sweets, an AI-powered virtual concierge for hotels. Please enjoy the time they spend at Elevate. I, Shivang and Vijay, all three of us have always believed in the future of voice. And every time there are hurdles that come up, every time there are problems that come up, we just, you know, go back to the vision that we thought of. That voice is the most natural medium of interaction. It's going to be very, very popular and common in the coming time. So we have to build a product that is future ready. There are problems, there are hurdles right now, but about it, if, if you can see it growing, we'll be the first movers in this industry. Perfect. 
And here with me today is Vijay Nandvani. Perfect. Here's your microphone. As you know the process, a short question to you. You have been back and forth between Austria and India, if I understood that correctly, for that elevate time. Now, um, what was most exciting to come back to Austria? Um, I would like to answer this question with a very small story. Uh, when, I, when, I, when, I okay. <laughs> uh, when, okay. I, when I came to Vienna for the first time for the program, I landed and I had a meeting with a potential client in, in just two hours of that. I discussed with them, and just, just after the meeting, I was so amazed that the product which we built in India for, for, for the problems Indians were facing, and, and, and that, that's applicable here as well. I mean, I hadn't expanded to some other market ever, but, but it made me feel so excited that the product is useful here as well, the problems are the same, and, and they, they're able to solve it. So I'm always excited to come again, talk to more clients here, get their feedback, improve the product, and also, excited of being here in Vienna also. Well, I think we can tell you're super excited to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. Um, we're now super excited about your pitch. Here's your clicker, here are your slides. Thank you. All the best, please give it up. Can you give me two glasses of water? और uh, मुझे यह भी जानना था कि uh, बेहतर उनका किराया कितना होगा। I guess none of you understood what I just said. <laughs> Imagine a luxury hotel has to deal with this every single day. Good evening, one and all present here. I am Vijay Nandwani, CEO of Espresso Labs, and I'm here to present your first product, Hello Sweet. Did you know that in Austria, 73% of all overnight stays are by foreign nationals, with more and more guests coming from countries such as Russia and China, the language problem gets even bigger. Even when the hotel is able to understand the language of the guest, they have to manually write down the request and actually call the right person and, and assign the request to them. This manual process often leads to requests getting lost. Hotels usually use tools such as Google Translate to solve the language issue, but ca it cannot convince you to upgrade your room. In times of booking.com, Creating additional revenue is extremely important for hotels. Yeah, uh, and, and upselling, which is one of the important sources of revenue, is not possible, it's, it's very limited with tools like these. If we talk about handling requests, the concierge desk, which has to write down the request and track the request, they have to spend up to 10 minutes some time with the guest, providing them information about the city. Do you think with the limited time which they have, they're able to provide the best services to every single guest? Our solution converses with the guest in their own language. It translates the request for the hotel. It then understands the request. It finds out the right department the request should go to and assign it to the, to the right person responsible in the team. And it is always available. The solution is to use a, a virtual concierge based on a smart assistant device, which can understand your request in, the, in, in, in your own language, then send the request back to the dashboard, where it is automatically managed and assigned to the right person and, and tracked or, auto automatically. The, that's, that's the most natural way of communication. That's the, that's the way it should be. And we are not just only good in understanding the request, answering questions, we go even a step further. Have a look at this. Just a normal day. The guest wants to know, hey, how would be the weather outside today? The system understands that it finds out that since it's going to be raining the entire day today, it might be a good idea to suggest, why not try a spa today? It's, and once the, the guest seems interested in that, it goes forward and finds out the available time slots in the, in the massage session, in the massage parlor, and then and also even books it for them. Just like that. So uh, we, we are actually automating upselling for the hotel. It's a process which is being automated by our platform. We improve the staff efficiency by five times. We provide enough data to the hotel so that the hotel management can take informed decisions. And finally, we have a solution which is finally accessible by all the people, leading to happier customers. Hotel managers are already realizing the potential of a solution. According to the 2019 Lodging Technology Study, 79% percent 
Yes, 79% of hoteliers believe that voice is the most impactful technology for hotels. And we are in a very, very rapidly growing market. By 2021, we are seeing a market worth $18 billion at a rate of 25%. If we, we started our operations in India with, uh, we, we started our operations three months back. We already have three big clients already on board. We have found potential clients here in Vienna. And Europe is a huge market for us with 380,000 rooms waiting for us to be deployed. Talking about a competitive advantage, we are the only hospitality app which has been approved by Google to, to work on the Google Assistant devices. Being on the Google Assistant infrastructure allows our application to run on the Google devices and also allows our application to support 25 more languages compared to others. We are being trained by some of the best experts in the hospitality industry. Our team, the core team, has been working together for the last five years. We have also founded a company together in the past. And we, we bring in the entrepreneurial knowledge, the skills, and, and we understand how to build a product. Our mentors from the hospitality industry, they bring in the experience of 50 plus years, and they are helping us build the right product for the market. Our customers are really, really happy with the product, our customers in India. Hyatt Hotels India recently published about us in the Hotelier India's magazine of the, this, of the February edition as well. So um, we, are, we are looking to uh, looking for seed investment. We are looking for strategic partners to collaborate with and pilot customers. Looking forward to talking to you later. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Vijay. I think your excitement transpired into your presentation as well. And I already saw during your pitch, one of the jury members grabbing the microphone right away after, I think, two minutes. So I know, do you want to start? I think you're eager to. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love the enthusiasm. Like, great, great stuff. Like, um, no, I mean, we were, you were talking about the languages, and, and the, then, but then I think you addressed the question later on, like, because I was thinking, for example, in, in India, right? You have, like, a ton of dialects. So does it support all, all the dialects as well? Yeah, so it, it supports about, about 12 Indian languages and has specific di dialect for English as well. So Google Assistant is, is supporting the num maximum number of languages in India, yes. Um, and maybe like one last question and then I'll pass it on. Um, so you have, you have a bunch of pilots, right? If I'm like with, with Wyatt and, and some other clients, yeah. are, they, are they currently paying? Yes, okay. in India. Is it, and what kind of model is it that they or like business model that you're using? So uh, with, with, with Pilot, what we did uh, when we approached them, they helped us actually build the product as well for the, the first client. So we gave them the devices, we took some money for that, and uh, they're paying us a monthly fee for the devices and the services which we are providing to them. They are paying a fee, and this would be the model similar which would be happening with the live customers as well, but it on a, the, the values would increase. Yeah. So it would be a monthly fee like per room or? So uh, the, the model would be that first we take a setup fee, a one-time setup fee where we provide you all the application and customize the application for the hotel. And then uh, we, we have two models right now. One is that some hotels want to pay a monthly fee per, per room per month, that's okay. So second one is some hotels might want that they are uh, per request fee. Mm. So that, that's, that, that's also what we are exploring. And, I'm, I'm sure soon we'll have a one model which works good for both of us. Yeah, I think that's a great model, the per request fee. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think you already answered it. Uh, answered it. It's, it's not an app that the guest has to download. It is a hardware. I guess it's the Google Home yeah. from the picture. Um, so the hotel needs to invest like in 100 rooms, 100 Google Homes. Uh, which would be one part of the you know, of the investment of the hotel, or is it, or is it renting of the of the hardware? So it's it's an investment of the hotel, but we have partnered with companies which can lease the devices. Mm -hmm. There's a monthly rental cost, so it's it's about twelve. Per, uh, it's it's about like one tenth of the cost which they have to pay monthly, and then they can pay it for ten months. So it's not a one-time cost. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of say trains um, the the software to be able to. Um, provide services for the particular hotel. Um, how dependent are you on Google? Like, what if Google says, uh, 
you Hello Suite is not able anymore to to use the whole Google system, then it, like the whole company needs to shut down. Or, I mean, um, everyone can build apps for the like like it's it's Android platform we have. So anyone can build, everyone can build the app for Android. Similarly, Google Assistant is another platform which is there, and people are building apps for that. But it's very limited to uh, customers right now. We know Alexa and Home are very limited to, to households. And that's why we are slowly moving towards getting them into businesses. And, and we, are, we are publishing apps and, and using the infrastructure. And, and that's, that's open. That's cloud is available, which anyone can pay for it and use the services. It's always open. You pay and use. OK, so basically, Google wants you to, to, yeah. to, to, to create something that, that can be used in a business world. OK. They, they actually helped us build this for the last six months. We were working, working with them closely and actually got built this with their help. I'm curious to learn a little more about the way that the guests of the hotels that your system is already available in um, interact with the system and how much education is still required for them to adapt. And do you have any numbers on, on average? How many questions does a guest ask your system? Yeah, so uh, when we started, it was difficult to make guests use the device because it's, it's something new. But, but over time, we have found a, a very good number of effective ways to, to uh, ease the process. Now, now, things like, hey, Google, send someone to clean my room. Just, just simple dialogue like, like this, we are able to make it work. And there's a, near the device, there's a very small tent card with just one statement. They can speak only one statement, and then the app takes them forward of how to, uh, how to use the app. You know, there are, there's, there's only one statement which they need to speak to start using the app. It's, it, now, now it's very intuitive. And um, also we have used tricks like, the small cards kept in the room. So there's a card on the laundry bag. See, now, now you know if you want to order laundry, this is the command which you can say. So we are training it at different places. We are giving them key cards and a lot of other things to smoothen out the process. Did you have um, complaints about privacy? Like, what if, what if a guest says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping here with my wife or with my affair, and I don't want the <laughs> tool to listen to me and maybe order something that I have screamed in the bed or so? Definitely. Um, <laughs> <you see? laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, no, no, actually, the privacy is, is one of the big, big concerns for us. And, and we, have, we have tried our, our best to actually have to solve it. So we, we, have done, um, we have done things like, first of all, we don't take any personal data of the guest. We don't know the name. We don't, know, we, we don't even know the gender. We don't even save a, save a voice recording. Everything on the Google side is also turned off. All we know is the room number and the text of the request which came. That's all. So room number two or three, ask for towels. That's it. So first, there's no personal information involved anywhere. Even the voice recordings are, are disabled on the Google platform. Then, then you always have the option to turn the device off, to mute the device. And, and, and some people is in, a, in, a, in one hotel, there were um, foreign nationals coming, important government people. So they, can, they also request to remove the device. They, they have the option to actually you know, remove the device. I don't even want to see the device. So, we have a lot of ways, and we also have a contact uh, with, in where people can talk and ask to delete the data if they want. So we also have a mechanism for that to be GDPR compliant. So we are taking it very seriously and have proper steps to cure it. Cool. I, I really like the idea. Could you maybe spend one or two sentences on the competition? The, the competition, yeah. Um, we have competition, but, but as you can see, the language is supported. Uh, we are the ones supporting maximum languages with 30 languages. If you see Quick and Volara, they're supporting only five languages right now, and Roxy is only a couple of languages. So um, Volara and Roxy are based in US, and uh, Go Moment is, 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 it hasn't launched the product yet, but they, they said they will launch with 30 support of 30 languages. They have said that. So let's see. And, and if you talk about the channel supported, channels is, is how many platforms your guests can use it. You don't need an application to download. It's, Google device has Google Assistant pre-built. You can use that app. You want to use it on Twitter. You want to use it, use it on Messenger. Any platform, SMS, you want to use it on, we can allow you that, customized for the hotel. And same with the notification goes on different, different platform for the hotel. So it's very customizable that way. Terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you also for answering. Yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Great, we're moving on and we're watching a little video about East Coast. They are bridging between, e they're the bridge between Western ideas and Eastern solutions. So enjoy. As an IT project manager, I saw myself quite often actually how many problems there are. But especially when you work with remote companies, there are a lot of projects that fail and a lot of money that gets lost, right? I realized many people are afraid of nearshoring or outsourcing in general because they don't know who are these people, can I trust them, that they can find. So we wanted to find a solution where we can find the perfect fit for these for these people on a strategic, cultural and technical level. A lot of applause for you. I just wanted to say please welcome on stage David Turevic from East Coast. Now for your Woo, yeah, exactly. Woo. Uh, for your startup, you travel a lot to Eastern Europe, if I know that correctly, and try to assess the market, meet with potential partners. What are your fondest memories? My, my fondest memories. Fondest or funniest? Whatever you feel like. Yeah, just go for it. <laughs> During that time, I was four weeks uh, traveling. I'm so sorry. Hello, hello. I was so excited about hearing your memories. It's on, it's on to it's you. On. Yes. So uh, for four weeks, I was traveling to whole Eastern Europe and I met five clients, um, five software agencies every day and sit a lot of, in a lot of different offices. So this, this wasn't that much fun, but it was very exciting, very interesting, and I learned a lot. But something fun, actually, at the end, I went in Serbia to a festival named Gucha. Does somebody know Gucha? It's great. It's really good. It's a <laughs> festival. It's a big festival, so you should go there. <laughs> Did it distract you a bit on your trip? Or? Well, it was at the end, so it's fine. I was at the end. Fine. Perfect. Now we're super excited to hear East Coast. Please, a big round of applause for David. Imagine your company wants to invest thousands or millions of years to develop a software application. Since they don't have the developers themselves, they look for a software agency to outsource the project. Well, most likely the company will lose a lot of money. 60% of all outsourced IT projects fail. And they fail because they are based on bad partnerships. Hi, my name is David, I'm the CEO of Eastcode, and we are the key to successful IT outsourcing. We did a detailed research on due diligence of software agencies and analyzed hundreds of projects. And out of 50 factors why projects fail, we analyzed that the three most important ones are strategic, technical, and cultural factors. It is paramount that a company fits with a software agency on these two levels to succeed. Well, so how do you find, find now a company on these two levels? Well, we used the following approach. We did uh, two years intensive analysis on the market, analyzed a lot of projects and wrote a scientific paper on the diligence of software agencies. We traveled over 7,000 miles and met a lot of CEOs, CTOs and business developers. They told us about their vision of their companies and we told them about ours. And then we contracted the 300 best software companies of Eastern Europe. And we have now a lot of data on technology, strategy and culture on these companies. Secondly, we developed a matching platform where the client can enter, put in all the information, the project specification, according to IEEE standard, is easy form, or in the form of user stories. If something is unclear, then they can chat with the software agencies through our integrated chat solution. And then, afterwards, we get all the data, we analyze it, crunch it through our system, and find the three best-fitting software agencies. Currently, we are implementing as well machine learning due to the vast amount of qualitative data that we are gathering and in order to be able to scale better in the future. We have three different models of collaboration. The basic model is professional matching. So the client comes to us, tells us about the project, and we find the three best fitting software agencies. But we analyzed also the Austrian market. We wanted to find out whether, what are the really the big concerns that they have here. And fear of failure and loss of control are two big concerns. So we made two additional models. 
For instance, with a troubleshooter model, the client gets a local project manager that guides the project from beginning till the end. And with the ease of mind model, we take the full liability for the project because then all contracts get signed by East Code. Our revenue is two-sided. From one side, we get 15% sales fee from the software agencies. And from the other side, we get either 25% or 40% on top of the projects from the clients. The matching itself is actually currently for free. So if anybody comes to us right now, at least till June, we think it will be like this, uh, the person doesn't have to pay for the basic model. And in the future, when our platform will be full matured and all processes are automated, we'll um, put as well a subscription fee for the software agencies because we are able to deliver high quality leads for them and therefore make them save a lot of customer acquisition costs. For the market entry here in Austria, we want to focus on mid-sized companies without in-house IT. By using our own network, we will um, set up a very strong direct sales department. With the use of content marketing and social media marketing, we position ourselves as experts in the Eastern European software market, and with referral programs, we will leverage our own network even more. So, let's take a look at the market. 56 billion euros are spent every year on IT outsourcing. Out of these, 12 billion just in Europe, and we have an annual growth rate of 4.4%. So the market is massive. And these are actually conservative numbers, because if you think about it, this is what is outsourced. But in theory, I mean, much more could be, actually. I don't say that everything should be, not at all, because in many situations it doesn't make sense. But uh, I'm just talking about the potential. So, and when we take a look at our competitors, we position ourselves between personalized consulting and digital solution. So, because we help the clients from project specification, from the proposal, till finding the perfect partner, we assist in the whole process chain through our digital platform. And most importantly right now, we are actually the only ones that are specialized in Eastern Europe and nearshoring. And why actually do we specialize in Eastern Europe? Well, because many studies show that a vast amount of really good developers come from Eastern Europe. In fact, half of the 12 best countries in software development are from this region. This year we want to acquire up to 100 clients and fully automate the platform. Next year expand to the DACH region and implement our subscription-based business model. And in 2021, we go global. We have already five clients successfully matched, and we will reach break even in a couple of months. So at the moment, we are bootstrapping. But as soon as we go out of the Austrian market, we will definitely need investment as well. That's our founding team. Mike worked in four different software companies. Clemens has built already a global successful business in Southeast Asia. And me, I analyzed hundreds of software agencies. We are the key to successful IT outsourcing. Currently, we are looking for strategic partners, and I'm happy to talk with anybody that is interested in our company. Thank you. Perfect. You can keep it, yes, because yeah. we're going to go with to the Q&A. And as far as I know, Clemens Blaschke is going to join you. Yeah, this uh, CSO will join me for, so for all sales-related <laughs> questions. Uh, he is the expert. Perfect. So the jury has another five minutes. I, I have two questions. First, how do you measure culture? <laughs> do you want to answer right away? <laughs> you want no, I mean, one? tell me first the second one, then I... Question. It looks like a lot of your revenue is uh, manual work because of troubleshooting and uh, ease of mind. So how scalable are you? So um, culture is difficult to measure, for sure. But there are many studies that actually try to measure um, uh, culture and companies. And there are way with questionnaires how we can uh, measure it and visualize e it even. So what we do is we use these questionnaires, we visualize it then, and then we can put in a graphical way the cultures of different companies uh, like over each other. So this is like a way how you can uh, measure it. Um, and the other one was how can we scale? Yeah, I mean, actually, 90% of all the processes that we have in our company are scalable. And right now we, have, we are doing this as well. Why we have as well the troubleshoot and ease of mind model is actually because we want to put a little bit more substance to it. And also because we are beginning here in Austria and we realized that here in this market, this is really a big, like, like the fear is really, really a huge issue. 
So we thought, okay, we can, we can help there. And for the troubleshooter model, actually, of course, we want to employ our own project managers, but we also want to partner with local software agencies. So this is a way to scale it. Just a question. Um, did I understand correctly you provide something like a guarantee? The, the ease of mind model, yeah. Right. So just mathematically oh, speaking, yeah. if yeah. currently you said 60% of the projects are, 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 are failing, mm -hmm. so to say, and um, from my gut feeling, I would say you, you, would, you would say it would be a success if you would get below 20% or below 15% of projects are failing. Now, if you have to guarantee in your payback the money for those who are failing based on your revenue model, you would, you would get with zero, get out with zero. Well, uh, we, we don't guarantee in the sense of that it, if it doesn't work out, we pay you back everything. But we take the full liability, which means we are responsible for it, yeah? So what, does somebody, it what does it mean? Well, it means that, that somebody could come to us and say, you, you fucked it up, you are, I can sue you, for example, let's say it, yeah? So, because we signed in all the contracts. I mean, why did we did this put actually in place? Um, many people say, okay, I would like to work with a company, let's say from Poland, Romania, or Slovakia, but I'm afraid to sign a contract with a company there because then what is when something goes wrong and I want to sign the contract with somebody here in, in this place because then of course like the, the liability is a totally different one. So this is actually what we, what we uh, and fear. And what, what, what actually do you guarantee? Like, um, so, so what then? So you guarantee and what, what, what in case something goes wrong? Let's say what if I... I've invested 12 months with, with a company from, I don't know, Ukraine, and I've burned several hundred thousands euro. What, how do you jump in now? Yeah. <coughs> so I think um, just to, to picture this uh, for you clearly, we have contracts with the software agencies individually, and we have contracts with, with detailed specifications of the projects. So in this contract, we will have information on what if, you know, what if the quality isn't what they expected? What if they don't deliver on a set time? And if those things happen in a contract, we will um, put all necessary details that we um, won't behold um, um, uh, eligible. But we have on the ease of mind model an insurance, so we can insure projects individually, and they will come up for the loss of money. They, I, I thought you will insure yourself and an insurance company or something similar to that will, will come up. Yes, yes. Yeah. We are working Absolute. with insurance with, You will work with insurance companies. Yeah. And um, from the... Did you talk to insurance companies about, about this whole thing? Because it, it, it seems yeah, to be quite did. a costly thing. Yeah, we did actually, yeah, and we are right now in, in talks, different ones, to find out what are the best deals to do this, right? But I mean, what is really important here to understand is that it's not so much about what happens when, we, you know, when at the end something happens. We try to um, really do the best at the beginning that no failure appears, really, actually, right? So we do the due diligence, we check the companies before, we check the clients before, and to make really sure that it doesn't happen from the beginning. No, the only thing I'm concerned, because if, if you provide something like guarantees, it, this might ruin a whole company because of contractual guarantees and stuff like that. That's why I would just, you know. Oh, I understand. Okay. So, like, uh, one question. I mean, besides the fact that on, on the cultural point, I'm not entirely sure which data points uh, that, that you're currently tracking, but the whole matching feels like quite a lot of human touch right now. So is there any kind of like algorithm tech behind it? How are you going to automate this? Where's, what's the stage of the tech right now? Yeah, well, actually the platform that I showed is like very, just a very little piece, right? Just for the presentation here. The platform is much bigger. So it's, it's really that somebody puts in the specification, puts in all the information that they have about the projects. Then they get their proposals directly to the platform. We analyze all the data and yeah, there is much more actually in the backend. Actually, it's around fifty thousand lines of code, I think, right now. So, um, and the 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 matching is done right now with the with the use of cost functions, but later we will use uh, machine learning for it. But right now, there is no ML tech behind it. Still not. No, we are we are like 
like evaluating right now which ML we want to use to, to make it happen. But we will definitely need it because we have so much data actually that we want to track, yeah. So for the marketing hours to, yeah, maybe I just answer <laughs> for, so for the, w what is important here to understand is also that for the marketing in Austria, we are learning as well, right? So we, for, for the clients that we have, there is a lot of manual work. We are working with them together to find really are out what, what the pain points are, what the problems are. We feed this into the system, make the system better and better with the time. And then when we go out of this market, we can use it to scale, right? Perfect. There will be a lot of time to talk about it, to go into more detail. Big round of applause for the two. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. We're just quickly jumping through. Do, 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 do. How are you guys enjoying it so far? <laughs> Ooh. Okay, so we are coming to the very last, definitely not least, startup to pitch here um, at the stage tonight. Um, and their name is Sengsio. I hope I pronounced it correctly. They're AI powered financial intelligence. And for that, we first day, of course, going to watch the video of their time at Elevate. Before starting a business, I worked uh, for 10 years. There's pros and cons on both camp. Obviously, I prefer being an entrepreneur. Um, the freedom you have, uh, the ability to change, the ability to witness changes with your business is exciting. It's very exciting. But at the same time, there's the security side. Um, when you don't have a, a full-time commitment, you're, you're letting go of the expensive. Um, it's, there's a lot of stress in, in many ways. Um, but um, I love it. it. It actually help you to grow. You, 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 you experience a lot of things you wouldn't have uh, working. Perfect. In a second. Remember, there's this one question I ask everybody. All oh, right, all right. So first of all, please welcome next to me, John Shen. It's great to have you here with us tonight. Um, now, you picked Austria as your starting market to conquer Europe. Why Austria? So firstly, as um, Vienna is a childhood dream of mine. I'm a big fan of classical music, so uh, this is the place to be. <laughs> I really love it. Um, and we actually invited by the gym program, um, Go, uh, Go Austria program to here. Uh, we like the, uh, the ecosystem here. We really like the fact what we do actually is, is at the same time um, uh, is in sync with the um, open banking initiative happening in Europe. So it's a lovely city to be in. It's a good ecosystem, and we are at the right time. Perfect. And how much classical music did you have time to enjoy while being at the Elevates? Quite a bit. Quite, Quite a, a bit? bit. The Schumbum Palace uh, last year in May, that was really good, phenomenal. And I've been to uh, the uh, music, I can't speak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're doing a good job. Uh, <laughs> Maybe you can convince the team in the future to join you yes, and yes. get some education into, into that, some classical education. <laughs> yeah. Here are your slides. You have five minutes, enjoy. Big round of applause. Good evening. My name is John, the founder of Zensio GmbH. Let me ask you a question. Why do business need accounting? Is it just to see where your money is? Is it just to meet the bare minimum of compliance and tax declarations? Or is it for something much more? We know that successful big businesses use accounting to help them with strategic decision making. Actually, compliance is a secondary concern for corporates, right? But why isn't the small business doing the same thing? Well, it's because small business owners such as Lisa are way too busy running the business itself. Accounting to her is such an obligation and it's so manual and so annoying and she just wants to make it someone else's problem to outsource it. So she picked shoebox. We all know the term, right? So you just pack all the invoices, incoming, outgoing, um, bank statements, receipts into this physical or a digitized shoebox, 
and make it someone else's problem. So he arrives at your tax advisor's office and he will do your tax for you, which is perfect. End of the year, you receive a financial statement. Looks really professional, looks a lot of numbers in it, but do you actually understand it? And most importantly, when it comes once every year, if anything goes wrong in there, it is way too late for your small business to react. Most importantly, all these questions for a small business owner remains unanswered. From your book, you don't get these questions answered. Am I profitable? When am I more profitable? Can I afford the 14th salary? If you want to find out those questions, obviously you can just ignore and just do your business anyway, but if you want to the answer of these questions, you, also, you always crunch the number in the best accounting system available, the Excel. And you will spend easily eight to 40 hours. When you reach 40 hours, you need someone full time to do this, just to get some ideas financially about your business. So we've, we know this problem. In the last three, four years, me and the co-founding team worked in the earlier business that we found, which is corporate focusing. How did corporate solve this issue? Well, they have a large, large team of people producing these reports. So we helped designing algorithm to mimic what these team do and try to make it easy for them. And now we're bringing it for the small business. We find for small business, cash flow is a lot more relevant than it is for the big business. So there's a lot of information within your bank accounts, in your transactions. We connect it to it, we interpret it, and in exchange, you get daily, real-time information about your business. Here's how it works. Cash flow comes in, whether by file, or direct integration with your bank, you see all these pretty graphs, which you usually see in accounting systems, but the most important thing with our system, you do not need to scan a single invoice. You don't need to enter anything into an accounting system that you need to learn. This is already within your transactions. How do we know, how do we do that? There's already a lot of information that you tend to neglect within your transactions. Things like your reference field, things like the other party you're dealing with, and the company registry information about this party. We learn all this data. We tag every single transaction so we actually understand your business much easier. So just a simple question about wh wh who is my major supplier? How much have I spent in the last 12 months? These sort of things are available to you every single day. And I'll say it again, you don't need to scan a single invoice. Within the team, we have 10 years experience in accounting, treasury management, Auditing, computer, uh, I mean, product development, AI. So we know what we are talking about. And we are designing a software really to revolutionize this problem set. So this is a um, B2B SaaS platform, made it um, a freemium model for small business. So it started free, but obviously, um, more they get um, a monthly fee, a fee they would pay. This is very complicated. I'll break it down to a very easy business development strategy. In the first half of the year, we're working on direct, uh, direct sales based. We try to reach out as many local small businesses as possible. Once we confirm the sweet spot of all their requirements, we're going to turn on our online channel. What we are solving is not a problem unique to Austria, to Europe. This is a global problem in the developed country. Our competition at the moment is those business inside, mostly Excel. A lot of people will say we're similar to BI tools, but I have to mention, in order for you to use a good BI tools, you need to have a good accounting system. If you don't maintain your accounts, you see nothing in your BI tool. We talked to a lot of um, startups in the last five months, actually um, more than 80 small startups. We found out their problems, and then we're already in the um, process of bringing more beta customers to get them to try out with our platform. We are aiming to turn on our online channel at the end of the year. We're aiming at 3,000 uh, SME free active users at the end of the year. And by then, we really hope um, the relevant investor will have to look um, at what we are doing. So today, our open beta is available. Please contact us. I'm sure in this room, you guys know another 60 small business. Please come and talk to me. And thank you so much for your time. The last pitch for tonight and the last jury round. Um, uh, two questions. So, 
Is the solution geared towards SMEs or is it geared towards like the bookkeepers and the accountants? Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, it's geared towards the SMEs, um, but we want to work with um, special financial advisors, so not necessarily bookkeepers at this moment. We want to focus on people who actually already help controlling, already help liquidity planning, and we, they will be a good multiplier for us at this very moment. Our big vision is to do with automated uh, bookkeeping. It's very costly, very competitive. It's not a battle that we are picking up right now. So we want to get as many users um, as possible using the sweet feature and slowly go towards the automated accounting. Yeah, but I've seen solutions that are geared towards bookkeepers or accountants, right? And yeah, you have, you have a bunch. And uh, it's very strong. The multiplier effect is, is really powerful in that case, right? So. That's right. Um, actually, I just quickly mentioned, thank you for bringing that up. Um, we are actually working with some of those uh, platforms. For example, Domanda, we are actually working with them because at this very moment, we are aiming at different things. So we can offer a lot more to what they could offer, and they could be a good multiplier at this stage. Yes. And then the, the second question, because I, you're, you're a Chinese company, right, originally, or? Originally, we're a Chinese company, um, and uh, the Zensio GmbH is a brand new venture that me and the, one of the co-founders uh, started. This is like a global company focused on the global market, um, okay. which has completely different focus than the other business, which is still running at, 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 as we speak at the moment. But the reason to come to Europe is PSD2? Yes. Okay. And the reason to come to Austria, because this is a wonderful um, <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you. So basically, if I understood correctly, you're extracting the data from the bank accounts and interpret it and um, use it as, you know, for the cash flow statements and for predictions of certain things, right? Um, the interpretation of, of, of this data, how, how, does it, how does it take place? Um, so, f firstly, let, let, maybe we'll drill into one specific problem set. Like, what do people do when they do liquidity planning, right? So, the, the common practice is that you take cash flow and then you categorize them. And then some of them, you can use historical cash flow to predict. The others, you can't. The others, you need to bring in the external information, such as your account receivable, account payable. So, but what we do is that, firstly, um, you, when you do a good categorization, um, you see your actual in real time. And this, is, we're talking about um, customized categorization, which is different to what uh, George would offer. Right. Secondly, um, we will, because we automatically categorize, and then they are able to, some of them is already done, the rest of them they can port in the file. That's why we work with platforms like Domanda and, and the other guys to bring in the accrual-based data to aid our analysis. But this is one small feature set of what we can offer. There's also fraud, um, like the, um, the risk detection and liquidity uh, related. Don't have enough time to talk about, but yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about the scenario where, where a person, where, where a small, you know, where Susie or Susanna or what was the name of the lady, um, she's relying too much on the software, and then she thinks everything's going fine, and maybe there was like um, misinterpretation of the categorization, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then she would have huge problems because because she was not talking to humans. That's right. We're not telling any of our customers, use our system, don't worry, this is going to solve all your problem. We're saying all these manual process you do with your Excel, your number crunching and this and that, if, it's, if there's a rule, if there's a pattern in it, we will do it for you. You still have a look at it. It's not like you just look at the end result, but it's much easier. You do the very minimal input on an already sorted um, analysis. So your work is minimized, not saying she don't do anything. She doesn't do anything. And is there an interface to each bank, or do people have to download from the banks the the, the accounts? Um, actually, this is um, this is the whole uh, thing with the PSD two. Uh, we are trying to work with third party providers at the moment. You know, FinAPI does it. Um, there's uh, Figo where we can integrate it, where they screen scrape every single bank. But what we are hoping is Austrian bank will finally finish their API, then it's a lot more accurate. Right, uh, but we're talking about Austria. But when we're global focused, we also support SCSV. In case you're a business, not only in Austria, you're also in 
I don't know, Dubai or, or something, <laughs> then you can combine and see the overall picture of your business, not just the European one. So you're in open beta. Have you been picking up traction? Uh, what are you doing to increase traction? And um, for how long are you planning to be in beta? And what's still necessary for you to fully launch a product to the market? Uh, actually, <laughs> it is really easy for me to say, let's just turn the knob and then you know just really get the online marketing. I think we are ready to do that. But we really want to take a slow approach in a way where we want to make sure we at least have 50 or or close to 100 of small business actually using it as every single day. And what we offer is actually a common problem uh, for, the, for the globe, then we will turn on our marketing channel. So we are actually, we're not waiting to do more development, but more wanting to hear the voice from the customer to find craft that um, solution that can be scaled uh, later on. So, yeah. I think she's coming for us. Exactly, I am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for answering all the questions. I will take that as well. And a big round of applause one more time. <laughs> Great. Well, you guys made it. We heard some amazing pitches up front. Um, can we maybe have another big round of applause for all of them together? I think they did an amazing job. <laughs> they were very, very well prepared, I think. Uh, so a big round of applause for the team and the mentors who prepared them as well. And here's again a short reminder. I mean, we already heard it. We are at the third badge already from Elevate. As you can see, let's reminisce together a little bit. This was the first badge. You can see some familiar faces. And it gets bigger. We are at the second badge already. And here it is, today's third badge. And as you guessed correctly, there is going to be a fourth badge. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> Elevate is growing and they're looking for amazing startups to join their fourth batch. The applications are still open until the 31st of March, as far as I'm aware. So please also, now that we are now shortly going to move into the networking, please approach the team directly, ask all your questions if you want to join the fourth badge. We're super excited to see some of you again at the demo day of the fourth badge. Also, what I love to see is how crowded this room is. I remember the first and the second badge they were full with attendees, but not as crowded as that there are not enough seats for you to sit. Um, so it's great that your attention is here that you're interested, just as we are, into these amazing startups and you want to hear the stories. Now, as you know, before we really move into the break, there is always this little short insert of thanking the amazing partners that support Elevate, that support the venture. So please, another last, I promise, big round of applause to our amazing partners. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Also, I thought it was really great and entertaining to have you guys here. So I would really like to thank you for taking the time and effort to not only be part of the program, but also be here today. So please, a big round of applause to our jury. <laughs> They're even getting yummy chocolate. So I think it absolutely for you guys to know next time, maybe be part of the jury, get something cool. Um, and as mentioned before, obviously this wouldn't be possible without an incredible team behind it. And as far as I'm aware, Christoph is gonna say a few words and thank his great team. So give it up for Christoph. Yeah, as, as, as I mentioned before, we wouldn't be here without the team of 32 amazing people and one person, it was up here already, but that really gave an impact to the third batch and that took over the third batch uh, in summer. That needs a big round of applause as well. So I'm asking Vali, please come here. <laughs> Joining us in July, um, having done a lot of 
experience in the startup ecosystem and now being our head of startup services. Thank you very much. You made this program even better than it was before. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. And obviously, Rika, who's been with us for the past three batches and hopefully for the fourth as well. Thanks Absolutely. Thank you so much. For always being here for our demo days. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was already telling the guys before that I actually thought this is already the fourth batch because there were so many amazing startups that have been presenting here over the past years. So I'm absolutely looking forward to the fourth one and doing it together with you guys and seeing the startups pitch. Now, as promised before, here's a short reminder. We have an amazing after party at Clio. Um, I don't know if it says it, but it's down at the Urania and it starts at 8.30 p.m. So after a little networking break here, all of us will go there and network a bit more. For you guys to know, we have from Blatt und Blüte, great finger food outside and obviously amazing drinks inside. And um, I would like to also thank the amazing live stream viewers for being with us in the afternoon and in the evening today. And there's going to be amazing interviews, as promised, in the studio afterwards. So please stay tuned and keep watching. For all the others, you guys are free to join the networking. And as the last, last big round of applause, maybe the team and the jury and the startups come up here and we take an amazing picture. Thank you, guys. Come on, join us. Join us.
Hey guys, and we are back in the studio, and what an event. Very exciting pitches. We had also from the batch number two, you saw Janos Lawrence with his pitch. They have come a long way since they were part of the batch two. And then the four amazing pitches from batch number three. Really an incredible evening. I'm sure you can hear how loud it is in here. We had a full house. People couldn't even find places to sit. And as we promised, we're back in the studio now with a little behind the scenes, a bit of a couple of interviews. And at this time, I have actually two members of our jury. We have Mona Hubel from i5 Growth and we have Arnaud Baca from Speed Invest. So welcome guys. Thank you so much for having us. Great being here. Thanks. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, you saw the pitches. Can you, before we get into that, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? What is your role? What is your organization doing, please? So with i5 Invest and i5 Growth, we work with uh, B2B tech companies over the entire life cycle. Um, we are not a typical financial investor in terms of we love being the first investor on board. And um, we invest in very hand-picked cases and we do this on a rather small uh, scale because we uh, hands-on support the companies, especially in the kick-off phase with pretty much all topics that are relevant at this point. Um, business development, growth hacking, hiring, which is always a huge topic. Um, and fundraising in follow on rounds. Thank you very much. And for you, or not? Uh, so I'm with uh, Speed Invest, basically. So it's uh, it's uh, an early stage VC in Austria. Um, we invest in yeah, basically early stage companies from pre seed uh, seed stage. Uh, ideally, with some kind of defendable tech angle as well. And we like to praise ourselves as not being like the traditional VC, but more of an operational VC. So uh, a bit like i5, we we also support with the more operational angle, which means either hiring uh, or growth and marketing or maybe U.S. expansion if they if those startups are keen on, on, on expanding to the to the U.S. So that's a bit our model in general. Um, so far, I think we've invested in over 140 companies. Uh, a lot of them doing like being quite successful right now. So yeah, it's been it's been really great. Nice. I like the smile also. <laughs> Good. Um, you were also part of the batch number three. You were mentors and already knew the, st the, the startups before we see the final culmination of that project. Can you tell us from your side, like what you see today? How do you feel about the startups? And I will start with you, Mona. With that. Well, I think it, uh, the startups all improved a lot. And it's, uh, I really enjoy personally uh, watching them develop over the last uh, few months. So I think the Venturi uh, really did a great job here. I saw them pitch before. I think today it was very much more on point than uh, last time when I saw them. And you can really see the effort that um, they all put into practicing and polishing their pitch. Definitely. How about you, Arnold? I mean, how was your, your process from mentoring them to coming and seeing them today? Yeah, I think I mean I think it's always great because you see you see kind of the trajectory they they go from. So we had a couple of sessions before Christmas. A lot of the questions that we might have asked today, they were like like Mona said, not on point at all. Like a lot of struggles around it. Uh, those questions were, were answered pretty well, I think, uh, in general today. And I, I think it's been a really like super great group. It's it's a very diverse group from different countries, whether it's India or China. Uh, a lot of enthusiasm and that's that's what we always look for so it, it's been really great yeah cool cool i mean i would imagine that you hear a lot of pitches constantly i mean that's part of your job so i'm actually curious for the entrepreneur watching what makes for you being on the other side of the table that what makes a startup pop for you like stand out from the rest from all of those that you hear out there Mona? Um, ideas are great, but execution is key. So what I'm always looking for is any signs of this team being actually able to execute on what they promise. Um, and and uh, I think the startups today also did a great job to really also show the diversity of their teams. And I personally have a good gut feeling that they will all really do well in, in executing uh, to reach their next milestones. Cool, thank you. And for you, Arnon? Uh, for me, it's always uh, the team in general. Like I, I like a really good story. I like when people are en en enthusiastic and they believe in their own vision, in their in their own story. And I think, like storytelling is is really key. A lot of a lot of uh, startups in Europe forget that angle. And like for example, their U.S. counterparts are way way better at at, at the storytelling in general. And 
and like for me it's I always look for a, for a very convincing team with with like high credentials behind them uh, but yeah the story is super important okay so for the entrepreneur watching us what would you say as a call to action when it comes to getting in front of one of you um, Like I think I have to come back to the, to my previous point. It's a story. Like for me, like I get I get hooked to the story. Like if if I sit across an entrepreneur and I can think of would I want to work for this for this person? Would I want to invest in this person? So it's it's really about yeah again the the story. Like if if there if there is no story, if there is no hook, you're gonna lose interest and and is is not gonna stay. So okay, thank you, and Mona. <laughs> Inspire me, I would say, yes. Whatever it takes, um, get me convinced that you believe in uh, what you're building, that you're building it for a reason and not just because um, it's cool to build something uh, and inspire me. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time and joining me here at the studio and also being part of the jury today and evaluating the startups. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Before we go now to our next interview, stick around because we'll be right back with Kathy Pinder and she's going to tell us everything about the elevator, uh, um, <laughs> Elevate Program Accelerator, Accelerator and how it is for you to also be part of Batch 4. Thank you. <laughs>